Well, it's been an encouragement to be with you this week. This is a great community. The Lord is doing great things here, and, and you've encouraged me. If you have a Bible, open up to Romans chapter 8, verse 31. We're going to be looking at Romans 8, verses 31 through 39. My message is titled, An Invincible Hope. What is hope? When, I, when my brother, my younger brother and I were 12 or 13, we went out for a baseball team during the practice, and we saw that this baseball team was going to be really terrible. And uh, we, told, we, we told my dad, uh, we don't, we don't want to play for this baseball team because we're not going to win any games. So we're just not going to play this year. But he made us play, and uh, we didn't have much hope, and we were right. We played 15 games, and we didn't win a single one. Oh, and 15. By contrast, this was a while ago, but I'm from Kentucky. In 1998, the Kentucky Wildcats won the national championship in basketball, and they were called the Comeback Cats because they'd fall far behind in the tournament, and no matter how far behind they fell, sometimes 15, 20 points, they'd come roaring back and win every game. And when you have a team like that, if you've been on a team like that, you know you have the resources to win even when you're far behind. You have hope, don't you? You have a confidence. Well, we have, Paul tells us, a great confidence in the gospel. That's what Paul emphasizes in Romans chapter 8, verses 31 through 39. In fact, I think that's the theme of all of Romans chapters 5 through 8. The theme is the hope we have in the gospel, the confidence we have in it. So let's read uh, those verses. I'm actually going to start reading, even though I'm only preaching on verses 31 through 39, I'm going to start reading in verse 28 of Romans 8. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. The first truth I see in this text is this. Our hope is invincible because God is for us. We see that in verse 31. If God is for us, and we sang about that as well, if God is for us, who is against us? And the answer is, we could say, a lot of things are against us. Satan is against us. Difficult circumstances are against us. Maybe some people are against us. Maybe disease is against us. Paul is not denying that we face such difficulties, is he? Indeed, if we were to share in this room, there's a lot of people in this room, if we were to share in this room the trials and the difficulties in this room, we would feel overwhelmed. So Paul's not denying that we have difficulties and trials. He's, his point is, none of those difficulties, none of those trials, none of those opponents will successfully defeat us. Finally, we will 
conquer them. God is working all things together for our good. Verse 32 explains how God is for us. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? So, so this is an argument, right, from the greater to the lesser. God has done the greatest thing possible for us. God has given us his son. Since he's given us his son, surely he will give us everything else. There's not one good thing that God withholds from us because of his love for us. So do you believe that? Do you believe that God has given you every good thing, that he's not withholding anything from you? The greatest gift, what's the greatest gift God has given us? The greatest gift God has given us is the forgiveness of our sins. Here's what Martin Luther said. If I knew that God wasn't angry with me, I would stand on my head for joy. So Christian, that's true, isn't it? God isn't angry with you. Do you know that? Do you know that if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, God is pleased with you? God loves you in Christ Jesus. Since God has given us his dear son, he will give us every good thing. Now, what's the good here in this text? The good is, we saw it in verse 29, the good is that we will be conformed to the image of his son. The good isn't that circumstances will be pleasant. The good is he will make us like Jesus. He has planned our lives so that all our circumstances will make us like Christ. That's why he allows trials and difficulties to enter our life so that we will become like Jesus Christ. Psalm 34 verse 10 says, those who seek the Lord do not lack any good thing. So do you believe that promise? That is, that is a great promise, isn't it? If you seek the Lord, you do not lack any good thing. God does not withhold anything from you. He loves you, and he wants to bless you. And not only that, he will bless you with every good thing to make you more like Jesus Christ. He is your good shepherd, and he loves you and cares for you. So our hope is invincible because God is for us. That's the first truth. Now let's look at verses 33 and 34. Our hope is invincible because God will never condemn us. Our hope is invincible because we won't be condemned. Now here Paul looks at the law court, doesn't he? And God is the judge. And he says, who will bring a charge against God's elect? So God's the judge. Who will bring a charge against us in the courtroom? Answer? Lots of people. Satan could bring a charge against us. Our enemies may want to bring a charge against us before God. Even our own consciences, our own thoughts, our own hearts, our own feelings may condemn us. But it doesn't matter what Satan says. It doesn't matter what our enemies say. It doesn't even matter what our own feelings are, what our conscience says. The only one that matters in this courtroom is the judge and the jury. And the judge and the jury is God himself. God is the one who justifies. He is the judge. He is the one who passes the only verdict that makes a difference. And he says, not guilty. Uh, when I lived in Portland, Oregon a long time ago, I had a friend who was a judge. He even, he even looked like a judge. He had the white hair, very dignified. And one, he, he, he was a friend of mine. So one day he asked me, hey, hey come, come to my courtroom. Watch me, watch me in a case, and then we'll go have lunch together, which I'd never done before. So, so I went there, and it was, it, was a, it was a very small little case. There was a, there was a prosecuting attorney, a, a young guy being charged for something, and this young guy didn't even have the attorney. So all there was in the courtroom was the judge, the prosecuting attorney, and the person being charged. 
And the prosecuting attorney raised uh, the issues against this guy and argued why he should go to jail and so forth and so on. When he finished, the judge simply said, as I said, it was a very simple case, the judge simply said to the guy, so how do you defend yourself? And then the judge said, not guilty. The prosecuting attorney left the room muttering under his breath. I don't know what he was saying. He was really upset at the judge. But it didn't matter. It didn't matter what the prosecuting attorney said. The judge declared him to be not guilty, and he walked out free. That is the way it is with those of us who belong to Jesus Christ. We are not condemned. Paul goes on to teach us that in verse 34. Who is the one who condemns? If we die slowly, and some of us will, if we die slowly, at that hour, usually what Satan does is he reminds us of the sins we've committed during our lives. Because when we're dying, we think of our lives and what we've done, and almost inevitably we think of the ways that we've fallen short. When those times come, and they don't only come when we're dying, when those times come, we want to defend ourselves with the truth of God's Word and the promises of God's Word. Do you do that? Do you use the promises of God's Word to fend off the attacks of Satan? There are some great promises in this text, or great declarations in this text, I should say. God will not condemn us. Four points here. God will not condemn us on the day of judgment because Jesus Christ died for our sins. Verse 34, our sins are laid on God's Son, and thus they no longer can stand against us in the divine law court. God will not despise the death of his Son. We are forgiven in him. Secondly, Christ Jesus was also raised. We read in Romans chapter 4, verse 25, Jesus was delivered over because of our trespasses and raised because of our justification. How do we know our sins are forgiven? Because Jesus died for us and he was raised from the dead, showing that God vindicated him and we belong to Jesus. So we are not righteous in ourselves, we are righteous in him. And God vindicated him by raising him from the dead. Thirdly, Jesus is now at the right hand of God. He has been exalted to God's right hand. And we have been raised with Christ. We are not guilty before God. We are raised with Christ. And he is sitting at the right hand of God. And finally, Christ Jesus intercedes for us. Jesus Christ intercedes with his blood before the Father. And he says, do not let that guilty person be declared guilty because they're righteous by means of my blood. They're not guilty anymore, as you know, Father, because you sent me to die for their sins. I had a person who I was counseling at the seminary who told me every day, this is an agonizing situation, he said, every day I worry about whether I'm a Christian. Every day I feel condemned. Every day I wonder if I'm really a believer. And I said to him, you ought, you ought to think of that. I mean, this is this particular person. You ought to think of that only once a year. You ought not to think of that every day. God doesn't want you to live in such a way. You ought to rejoice in what Christ has done for you. Corey Ten Boom says, God has thrown our sins into the deepest sea. And he's put up a sign in the sea, and the sign is no fishing. Our sins are forgiven in Jesus Christ. Thirdly, our hope is invincible because Christ's love will not let us go. That's verses 35 through 39. Paul says in verse 35, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? And this time, he thinks of the things that can separate us from Christ's love. Tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, and sword. We read in Psalm, uh, we read in verse 36 that Paul cites Psalm 44. 
So we, we, you, we see a quotation here from the Old Testament. I want to read you a little bit of the Old Testament context of Psalm 44 so you can see how that fits. This is a really interesting psalm. For your sake, uh, Paul says, we are being put to death all day long. We are considered as sheep for the slaughter. Psalm 44 considers the sufferings and the indignities and the hard times that Israel was facing. So we're going to pick it up in verse 14. This is what the psalmist says. He says these things to God. You have rejected us and brought us to dishonor and do not go out with our armies. You cause us to turn back from the adversary. You give us a sheep to be eaten and have scattered us among the nations. You make us a reproach to our neighbors, a scoffing and a derision to those around us. You make us a byword among the nations, a laughingstock among the peoples. Now, when we read these things, we think, if we've read the Bible a, a, a lot, we think it must be because they've sinned that all these things have happened, all these bad things. But look at verses 17 through 19. This is what the psalmist goes on to say. All this has come upon us but we have not forgotten you. All these things have happened, but they've not forgotten God. And we have not dealt falsely with your covenant. Our heart has not turned back, and our steps have not deviated from your way. Yet you have crushed us in the place of jackals and covered us with the shadow of death. All these things have happened, but they haven't forgotten God. Verse 22 adds, For your sake we are slain all the day long and reckoned as sheep for the slaughter. So, so let's step back. If you've lost me for a minute, let's step back. Why does Paul cite Psalm 44 when we look at the context? Why does he bring up that, this verse? To show, to show that terrible sufferings can happen to Christians. We see it in Psalm 44. We see it throughout history. God loves us, but that doesn't mean that he spares us from suffering. It is not right, is it, for someone to say, those whom God loves will not suffer. God doesn't promise that. Christians are persecuted for their faith. Some Christians are put to death for their faith. That may happen to some of you in this room. Some of you may be put to death for the sake of uh, Jesus' name. Some Christians, did you see the verse? Some Christians starve to death. We have brothers and sisters who are starving to death right now. The Bible doesn't promise, does it, that we won't starve to death. The Bible promises God will be with us, but he do it doesn't promise he'll spare us from such things. I had a student I taught whose teenage son was killed by a drunk driver. How painful that was, how it pierced his heart. I had a student when I taught at Azusa Pacific who was raped at 4.30 in the afternoon, on a sunny Sunday afternoon. No, we're not exempted from trials and sufferings, and none of us knows what those sufferings will be. Are the sufferings so great that they will sever us from God's love? Can God's love sustain us in the worst of times? Paul says, yes, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. None of these terrible things will triumph over us. We're not just conquerors. We're more than conquerors. That means that God takes those bad circumstances in our life and uses them to strengthen us. That doesn't mean they're pleasant, but he uses them for his glory and for our good so that we become more like Jesus. I wish you could have seen this man who lost his son killed by a drunk driver. He had a tender love for Christ in his life. He had a faith that strengthened me when I talked to him. When I talked to him, I was encouraged. I thought I could encourage him, but he would encourage me with his faith. The young woman who was raped, and I counseled her, she forgave the man who did that to her. That was remarkable to me. Her, her testimony to me was a sign of the power of God. It wasn't her strength that did that. It was the power of God in her. By the way, she testified against him, so 
that he'd go to jail. And that was a good thing, wasn't it? She could forgive him and still testify against him. Those two things aren't contradictory. But what was in her heart? It wasn't revenge and hatred, finally, but love. I don't want to be simplistic here. I'm not denying that there may be a long struggle to love and forgive in that case, that it may be something one struggles with for days and years. God works with us slowly, doesn't he? But he does promise we will conquer, that his love will reach down and strengthen us and sustain us in difficult times. There's nothing that can separate us from the love of God. Not death, not life, not present circumstances. Are you worried about the future? Not the future. Not angelic powers. Not the valleys and precipices of life. I take it from this that no genuine believer can ever lose his salvation. Now, some people interpret this a little differently, and they say all these external things cannot separate you from Christ's love, but you yourself can choose to deny the love of Christ. You yourself may make a choice to detach yourself from Christ. But I think that reading misunderstands this text. Doesn't Paul mention here the very things in our lives that would cause us to turn away from him? What is it that would cause us to turn away from Christ? Would it not be being put to death? Would it not be starving to death? Would it not be great trials and persecutions? And isn't his argument that none of these things will sever us from the love of Christ? So I think Paul's argument here is this. His love, Christian, will keep us. His love will sustain us. He will be with us. He will not let us go. He'll strengthen us in the hardest hours. We are prone to wander, and we only make it because of God's grace. Do you, do you know the, that hymn? It says, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, O oh, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. And what does the Bible teach it? He has sealed it. And he will seal it. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for your love in Jesus Christ our Lord. We pray, Lord, in our darkest hours and in our hours of intense joy that we will always know the love of Christ, the power of Christ, the forgiveness of Christ, and the joy of Christ. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. We hope you enjoyed this message. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Learn more at biola.edu.